you ever seen a picture of a place that you said, I don't know where that is, but I want to go there? Has that ever happened to you? I remember, a sem- I might have shared this already, but I was sitting in seminary, and I was sitting behind a girl that had her computer, her laptop, you know, there, and she had a picture, might not have been this one, but it was very similar to this. And I said, and I asked her, I said, where is that? And she says, I think it's the Grand Tetons. And I said, oh, man, I've got to go there. I didn't, and this is embarrassing. I mean, I was like in my, what, close to, yeah, I guess I was probably in my 30s, but I didn't know about the Grand Tetons. Can you believe that? But um, I have gone there several times since then. We've taken Tim, we've taken Amanda, we've taken Josie. So anytime we have to go across country, if we can, we try to go through Yellowstone and uh, go to the Grand Tetons. And if you haven't been there, it's beautiful. But uh, anyway, so just the desire to go to somewhere so spectacular. And you know, the amazing thing is when you look at that, that's probably the result of the flood. So even the things that we look at as being so beautiful and so spectacular are the result of sin. But uh, so when you look at that and you say, if that is the result of sin, just imagine, just imagine the beauty of heaven, right? I don't know how many of you have seen the Northern Lights I've had quite a few friends uh, lately post, I guess there have been quite a display of northern lights lately, and I've seen their pictures on Facebook, and it has made me quite jealous. Uh, But if you've ever seen, I mean, there's nothing to me, probably because they're rare, but when we lived up in, uh, in Canada, going out and seeing the northern lights, and I would just, I mean, seeing lights just dancing around in the night sky. I mean, it's really, really spectacular. And, uh, but trying to describe it to somebody who has never seen it, there are just some things that you just have to experience for yourself. I share these illustrations with you because, number one, the Grand Tetons, I saw a picture and I was like, man, I have got to go there, right? The Bible gives us a little description, not a lot, but a little description of the new heaven, the new Jerusalem. And if you read the description, it's like, I have got to go there, right? And then the Northern Lights, it's really hard to describe it. You have to experience it for yourself. And you think about John seeing the new Jerusalem. And here, there are so many, not just John, but so many of the prophets describing experiencing the presence of God, and they're trying to describe it as best as they possibly can in human language. And imagine the frustration that they must have had saying, how can we put it into human language? How can we put it in human words that our audience will be able to understand? There's just no way to do it. You have to experience it for yourself. And so they're trying to describe it, but just saying, just make the decision to be there for yourself. More than anything, we want you to be able to experience it for yourself so that you can see it and you can just be exposed to the awesomeness of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, however, as it is written, What no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. Right? We just can't do it. We cannot imagine what God has prepared for us. I remember as a student missionary trying to explain and trying to describe to a very good friend of ours an escalator. Right? And for those of us who are here, it's like, you gotta be kidding me, right? But trying to explain to somebody who's lived on an island, no electricity, no running water, and I'm starting to sing Gilligan's Island anyway in my head, but trying to describe moving stairs 
that go from one floor to a second floor, right? Well, then you have to describe what is a second floor because, you know, on the island I was at, they didn't have second floors, right? But this idea of getting on these things that would move you from one level up to the next. And I remember flying back from Madro, flying to Hawaii, and watching as a lady from one of the islands, I don't know which island, but getting there in the airport in Honolulu and coming to the escalator, and she had no idea what to do. And there was an airport employee who said, come on, come on, you know, and he took her by the hand and he helped her step onto these stairs. And I remember her laughing as she went up on the escalator, right? That's a very simple illustration of, you know, again, trying to describe the things of God to somebody who just cannot fathom what God has prepared for us. Now, continuing on in our series of the Great Controversy, last time we talked about the second coming of Jesus. And this is uh, chapter 40 of Great Controversy, and there's so much in that chapter that I've divided it into half. And so this is the second half of that chapter. Now, you think, let me go back a little bit. So, Remember when Jesus ascended into heaven, the angels told the disciples, he's, you know, they said that this same Jesus will come, will return in like manner as you have seen him go. How did Jesus go? He went up in the clouds. So the angel said he'll come back in the same manner. So he'll come back in the clouds. And you look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will be the first to rise. After that, we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord, where? In the air, air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Right. Do we believe, as Seventh-day Adventists, do we believe in the rapture? Trick question, right? Because what does rapture mean? Caught up or take up, right? So we believe in a rapture. We don't believe in a secret rapture, right? Because you read the verses, and it says, with the trumpet call of God, with the loud command, right? Does that sound like a secret? No. I mean, it's a loud, visible audible event. So we do not believe in a secret rapture, but we do believe that we will be caught up. And that's very important because when false Christs appear on the ground, we know from Scripture that that's not Jesus, right? He will be up in the air, not on the ground. Now, when you're looking through Scripture, are there other stories about other people being caught up? right there, right? Elijah, right? And when the description of Elijah being taken up, how does it describe it? Chariot of fire, right? Or fiery chariot. Now, when we think about that, we think of a fiery chariot or whatever. What do we picture that in our mind as being a horse-drawn chariot, right? We visualize that as being what? We know what a chariot is, so therefore when the Bible describes it as being a chariot of fire, that's what we visualize, right? Well, it's kind of interesting. I wonder if we might, I wonder if sometimes we might have a slightly misconception of this, and I'll tell you why. So take out your insert. And the first paragraph on the top there, Great Controversy 645, this is the description. Jesus has come down. The dead have been resurrected. We are up in the clouds together, and we are ascending on our way from earth to the new Jerusalem, right? 
On each side of the cloudy chariot are wings, and beneath it are living wheels. And as the chariot rolls upward, the wheels cry, holy. And the wings as they move cry, holy. And the retinue of angels cry, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And the redeemed shout, hallelujah, as the chariot moves onward toward the new Jerusalem. So how is it described? It's described as a cloudy chariot. But what does this cloudy chariot have? Wings and wheels, right? Moving wheels, yeah. Oh, living. I'll, I'll just be quiet. You guys keep going. <laughs> but you have this, so, right? So it's not, just, it's not just the fact that it's clouds, but there's wings and there's wheels and all this sort of stuff. Now try to describe, what does that look like? It's very hard to describe something that you've never seen, isn't it? As I was thinking about that, you know, you think about prophecies, certain prophecies that are given in the Old Testament and through Scripture. I wonder, and we have the advantage of looking back to a lot of those prophecies, and we have the advantage, of, you know, hindsight, what do they say, it's 2020. But we look at these prophecies and we say, yeah, duh, right? It makes total sense. But I wonder if people like in the time of Isaiah, if they're reading his prophecies, if they said, a virgin shall conceive. I wonder what that means. I wonder if it's symbolic. What does he mean by a virgin, right? You know, I wonder if they looked at it and said, I don't get it, right? Or you look at Isaiah 53, Right? And we say, oh, yeah, it's very clear about the description of Jesus' life. But did the Jewish people, did they get it? Did the disciples, did they get it? So for us, I look at a lot of the prophecies and say, I wonder what he means. I wonder what John means when he sees, you know, certain things. But when we get to heaven, as we look back, I'm just like, oh, it was so clear. How come we didn't get it? Right? So how, how can we describe or understand what this looks like? We don't know, right? But when we see it, we're going to be like, oh, yeah, that makes perfect sense now. Yeah. So there's other parts in the Bible that describe something similar to what the great controversy describes. And we can go to Ezekiel chapter 10, verses 15 through 17. Then the cherubim rose upward. These were the living creatures I had seen by the Kabar River. When the cherubim moved, the wheels beside them moved. And when the cherubim spread their wings to rise from the ground, the wheels did not leave their side. When the cherubim stood still, they also stood still. And when the cherubim rose, they rose with them. Because the spirit of the living creatures was in them. Does this sound familiar? I mean, it sounds similar to what we just read from the Great Controversy, okay? Okay, let's look at the next uh, paragraph there. So we're moving in this cloudy thing, right? Going to the New Jerusalem. It says, before entering the city of God, the Savior bestows upon his followers the emblems of victory and invests them with the insignia of their royal state. The glittering ranks are drawn up in the form of a hollow square about their king, whose form rises in majesty high above saint and angel, whose countenance beams upon them full of benignant love throughout the unnumbered, throughout the unnumbered host of the redeemed, every glance is fixed upon him. Every eye beholds his glory, whose visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Upon the heads of the overcomers, 
Jesus, with his own right hand, places the crown of glory. For each, there is a crown bearing his own new name, Revelation 2.17, and the ascription, holiness to the Lord. In every hand are placed the victor's palm and the shining harp. Then, as the commanding angels strike the note, every hand sweeps the harp strings with skillful touch, awaking sweet music in rich, melodious strains. Rapture unutterable thrills every heart, and each voice is raised in grateful praise. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Revelation chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. So it's given the description of the saints being gathered around Jesus in a hollow square. So there's an empty square in the middle. And when I read that, I think of the children of Israel going from Egypt to Canaan and the way the Bible describes the tribes being around, you know, formed in a square but there was an empty spot in the middle. What was that in the empty spot? The tabernacle, right? So I just find that interesting. So here's kind of a, our, you know, like I said, nobody can really, we can only do the best we can with our imagination, but here's kind of a picture of Christ being in the middle, kind of lifted up above all the redeemed. And you think in this, it talks about how Christ, with his own right hand, will place a crown on each one of their heads. Just imagine, just imagine what it would be like to have Jesus himself place a crown on your head. Paul, writing in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, he says, Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Here's another artist's depiction of what it might be like. And like I said, I mean, there's just no way that we can, anything that we come up with is going to be far, far inferior to reality. So as we get closer to the New Jerusalem, you know, people, you know, how can we do it? You know, how can we try to describe what it's going to be like, right? But in Revelation chapter 21, verses 15 through 16, the one who spoke with me had a, golden, a gold measuring rod to measure the city and its gates and its wall. The city is laid out as a square, and its length is as great as, its, as the width, and he measured the city with a rod. Now this... Particular translation said 1,500 miles. Another one said 1,400 miles. Whether it is, it's big, right? But here's the interesting thing. Its length and its width and height are equal. So it's as tall as it is wide and long. Get it? So 14, 1,500 miles or whatever. This is huge. But it's also tall. Now, now, some people would say that, based on that description, that the New Jerusalem is a cube. I have a, I have a hard time with that, and this is my personal opinion. I have a hard time with that because when you look at nature and you look at creation, very rarely is everything so, in nature, everything so symmetrical that it is so square and boxy. Nature kind of revolves around circles and curves and everything. And so when, it, when I think of it as being as high as is wide and long, I think of it being more of a kind of a pyramid with God alone being at the top. That's just my I. But the thing is, when we get there and we see it, nobody's going to be disappointed, Right? 
No one is going to say, oh, man, I thought it was going to be like this. Um, you know, we're just going to be happy to be there. Okay, open your Bibles to Revelation 19. Yes. Oh, twice as high as the space station. So that puts a perspective on it. So Revelation 19. And I have done, in my time here, I've already done a, um, a sermon on the New Jerusalem, so I'm not spending a lot of time on it, but starting in verse 6, then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, and like loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. Okay? So John, in vision, he hears this great noise. And what is this great noise? The sound of the redeemed, praising God for everything that he has done. So I think about, I mean, just try to imagine what it is like when we finally arrive at the New Jerusalem and the gates are thrown open and those gates are made out of what? A pearl, a single pearl, right? And there's 12 gates around the city. So just imagine going in and you're finally home. Finally home. Look at the next uh, paragraph at the bottom of the first side. As the redeemed ones are welcomed to the city of God, there rings out upon the air an exultant cry of adoration. The two atoms are about to meet. The Son of God is standing with outstretched arms to receive the Father of our race, the being whom he created, who sinned against his maker, and for whose sin the marks of the crucifixion are born upon the Savior's form. As Adam discerns the prince of the cruel nails, he does not fall upon the bosom of his Lord, but in humiliation casts himself at his feet, crying, Worthy, worthy is the lamb that was slain. Tenderly, the Savior lifts him up and bids him to look once more upon the Eden home from which he has so long been exiled. It's hard to imagine, right? Hard to imagine if you were in the place of Adam recognizing that all the sin, all the destruction that's taken place through the centuries was the result of your choice. It's hard to imagine, but imagine the joy that Adam will have when he sees the home that he once had to see it there again and to recognize that he is only there because of the love of Jesus Christ. As his expulsion from Eden, sorry, first top paragraph on the back. After his expulsion from Eden, Adam's life on earth was filled with sorrow. Every dying leaf, every victim of sacrifice, every blight upon the fair face of nature, every stain upon man's purity was a fresh reminder of his sin. Terrible was the agony of remorse as he beheld iniquity abounding and in answer to his warnings met with the reproaches cast upon himself as the cause of sin. With patient humility, he bore for nearly a thousand years the penalty of transgression. Faithfully did he repent of his sin 
and trust in the merits of the promised Savior. And he died in the hope of a resurrection. The Son of God redeemed man's failure and fall. And now, through the work of atonement, Adam is reinstated in his first dominion. As part of prayer meeting, we've been going through the book of Genesis. And you think how long they lived and all the sin that they saw happen during that lifespan. I mean, you know, Adam lived 900 and, what is it, 50 years, I think, or 30 years. You know, Methuselah, 969 years. That is a long time. And uh, you think about sin and everything. Death was probably a sweet blessing for them after all those years. Okay, let's go back to Revelation I have read this passage many times when I've gone to the hospital and visiting with people when they're about to die. So if I ever come to the hospital and read this to you, you know you're in trouble. (laughs) I'm letting out my secrets here. Anyway, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. This morning at Sabbath school, Bonnie well, Bonnie Edgerly, I have to clarify. <laughs> but we were, t- we were actually talking about this. And she says, you know, you can correct me if I uh, re-paraphrase what you said. But, you know, we've, we've talked about how it's impossible for us to describe what the New Jerusalem is like. And she made the statement that John was describing it not so much of what is there, but by what isn't there that we could understand the fact that there's no more death, that there's no more sorrow, that there's no more pain. That we could understand. And just, it's impossible, right? Okay, last one. The cross of Christ will be the science and the song of the redeemed through all eternity. In Christ glorified, they will behold Christ crucified. Never will it be forgotten that he whose power created and upheld the unnumbered worlds through the vast realms of space, the beloved of God, the majesty of heaven, he whom cherub and shining seraphim (laughs) delighted to adore, humbled himself to uplift fallen man that he bore the guilt and shame of sin and the hiding of his father's face till the woes of the lost world broke his heart and crushed out his life on Calvary's cross. That the maker of all worlds, the arbiter of all destinies, should lay aside his glory and humiliate himself from love to man will ever excite the wonder and adoration of the universe. As the nations of the saved look upon their Redeemer and behold the eternal glory of the Father shining in his countenance, as they behold his throne, which is from everlasting to everlasting, and know that his kingdom is to have no end, they break forth in rapturous song, worthy, worthy is the Lamb that was slain and hath redeemed us to God by his own most precious blood. The mystery of the cross explains all other mysteries. 
and the light that streams from Calvary, the attributes of God, which had filled us with fear and awe, appear beautiful and attractive. Mercy, tenderness, and parental love are seen to blend with holiness, justice, and power. While well, we behold the majesty of a throne, high and lifted up, we see his character in its gracious manifestations and comprehend as never before the significance of that enduring title, Our Father. You know, I, I said earlier that in prayer meeting, we're going through the book of Genesis. And we've just covered the flood. Sorry. You think about Noah and his family getting on the ark. Think about Noah for 120 years pleading with people. Come in. Come in. And the people refusing laughing at him, mocking at him, and just refusing. But I wonder if there was anybody there who maybe maybe just a little bit inside their heart said, you know what, I would like to go. I would like to get on the ark, but what are, what are my friends? What are my family? What are they going to say if I make that choice? And so they choose not to get in. And because of that choice, they were lost. And I think about Jesus. I mean, he loves us. He loves each one of us so much that all as he wants is he wants us to love him back just a little bit. And he's pleading and he's begging. And he says, I've, I've done everything for you. What more can I do for you? Please, please choose me. And how many times every day he has to deal with people choosing to reject him. In our scripture reading that that, uh, Peter read, Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place for you so that you can be with me. Jesus wants to spend eternity with us. You know, the title, Home at Last, you think about what does home mean? And you can think about many different things, but I think most of us would agree that home is not a building. That home is people. And it's hard for us to imagine a place where we truly belong, where we truly belong, where we feel safe, that just imagine the fact of not only sin and death and all that sort of, but no longer temptation, where we are truly, where we belong, that we're truly at home with God. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as, as we have talked about the new Jerusalem, as we have talked about the redeemed going home, Father, it must be probably amusing to the angels on how far off we are as far as the beauty, the glory of everything that you have prepared for us. But Father, regardless of how beautiful it must be, Father, I pray that for each one of us that our desire more than anything else is to be there because that is simply where you are. Father, I pray that you would be with each one of us. We get so preoccupied with the here and now that we lose sight of eternity. And Father, how tragic it would be if there was one person, one person in this room that would lose out on eternity simply because we like what we have here more. And so, Father, I pray that you would be with all of us, myself included. The fact that that we would recognize that there is nothing, nothing that this world has to offer that is worth a second if we were to miss out on spending eternity with you. 
So, Father, I pray that you would be with us, that we would recommit ourselves to you, that we would pledge ourselves and with everything, with all of our living being, that we would commit ourselves to you so that we will be ready whenever that time comes. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen.